The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good morning, everybody, or afternoon. We are about to get started here. Well, we wanted to welcome everyone. I'm John Klass, the Deputy Executive Director here at AMSIS. On behalf of AMSIS and Vice Admiral Mike Cowan, we're pleased to have you at this second uh, AMSIS student webinar titled, What's Up with Military Residencies? This one will focus specifically on the Air Force. Uh, just to give you a little background on AMSIS, is a nonprofit, membership-based organization. We offer free membership to students for a year, and after that, it's only $50 while you're still a student. Our resources, including seminars like this, will help you grow in the military medical community. We ask you to visit our website and please join us. We could use the all the members that we can get. Um, and our website is uh, amsis.org. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Mel Soroy here at AMSIS for some quick housekeeping uh, items and then learn more about your military residences in the Air Force. You're going to be hearing today from Colonel Mike Porgione, Lieutenant Colonel Rosie LaBay, and Ms. Kelly Adams. Mel? Great. Well, thanks everybody for being here today. Just a couple quick notes before we get started. If you can please be sure that your phone or your computer are on mute, we would much appreciate it. This webinar is one hour flat, so we will be done at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. And then if you did submit questions, we much appreciate that. We're going to do our best to answer those as we flow through the webinar. And then if you want to add any additional ones, there is that section where you can add them in. And I do apologize if it says AMSIS Navy Student Webinar. That should say Air Force. So just a typo on the lovely technology side of that. So again, we'll do our best to address any of those. And then within a week, you'll receive a copy of the webinar to the email address that you submitted. It will also be available on our website, AMSIS.org, as John mentioned. At the top of that in the student section, it's sort of a yellow button floating up there. And then if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. You can email me at mel, M-E-L dot Soroy, S as in Sam, I-R-O-I, S as in Sam, at AMSIS.org. And with that, we're going to get started. Air Force, I'm going to hand it over to you, but in just a second, I'm going to put up their presentation so that they can definitely flow easily with this. So if we just hold on, we'll get going. Um, the three of you, if you want to start introducing yourself, please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Can, uh, can you hear me, Mel? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So I am uh, Colonel Mike Forgione. I am uh, the Chief of Physician Education and in charge of all of Air Force graduate medical education, um, as well as uh, kind of tracking you guys through the HPSP and USHIS uh, time uh, as well. I have with me uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rosie LeBay, who works with me in my office. She is currently my deputy. Uh, I'm an internist. She's a surgeon, so we should be able to cover at least those sides of the house with some detailed questions. Uh, and then we also have joining us uh, someone you probably all know and love, Ms. Kelly Adams from AFIT, who I'm sure you've been working with if you're an HPSP student um, and you've been and you know, at least past the first uh, six months of the year. So, um, But that's who the team is. And uh, I'm going to start on slide two. And so I'm going to provide you a little bit of background uh, on the Air Force Medical Corps and then talk about our section, which is physician education, where we manage all the GME uh, programs. And then I'm going to go through uh, our GME programs um, and talk a little bit about some of those, uh, talk about the two processes that manage uh, GME in the Air Force and how they work and how they're intertwined. Um, and, and with that, that'll be where most of the slides are focused. And then at the end, we're going to touch on a couple of uh, small things, active duty service commitments, which is what that acronym stands for. And then um, there's a new pregnancy policy, and, and we'll, I'll touch on how that pertains to graduate medical education. So with that said, let's move to the next slide. So in November, we took a look across the Air Force. Um, and looked at the number of uh, officers in the United States Air Force. 
Um, and so what you see on the slide uh, is that the Air Force uh, has about 60,000 officers in it at any one time. Uh, the, and, you know, for purpose of discussion, the Medical Corps is a little different than the line of the Air Force in that the total number in the force drive the different ranks. But in the Medical Corps, that's not necessarily uh, true. Uh, we're, we don't base uh, our promotions uh, on quotas based on the total number in the Medical Corps. So when you look at the Air Force Medical Service officers, it's about 10,000 plus uh, in any given year across all the different corps that make up uh, uh, the Air Force. And when you specifically look at the Medical Corps, which is what you folks will be in, and I'll touch on that in a slide, um, we have 3,338 as of November 2015. Now, I know one of my good friends just retired, so that number may be 3337, but in general, at any one time, this number, these numbers in the Air Force will go up and down because every month we have people that we're assessing and that are retiring. And then here's the breakout in terms of colonels, lieutenant colonels, majors, and captains. Now, this includes folks that are currently on active duty status in graduate medical education. Next slide. So when I, when I look at those numbers here on the right, you can see that wonderful pipeline. You, we have the folks in medical school, and as of this academic year, we have 1,104 HPSP students, uh, at least that's the number I was given, and we have 210 in the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. Um, and then you can look at the breakout of our Air Force GME um, in terms of we have a total of 859 in active duty military training programs. 91 are on active duty status but doing training in a civilian program but paid salary by the Air Force, hence that active duty status. We have 360 folks that are in residency or fellowship training in civilian status. So they've been separated from the Air Force and then they will come back into the Air Force that. Then we have a small program called the Financial Assistance Program, which bring targets folks in, in residency and help, help, helps them to pay back their medical school debt, and then they come in to the Air Force when they're finished that residency training. Next slide. So in general, when you look at this um, and you subtract out the folks in training, we have a very perfect system that has evolved over the last 25 to 30 years that has me having 25 potential physicians, 2,500 potential physicians that are working as credentialed providers or leaders in the Air Force. And then that pipeline that supports that, including you guys, is 2,500 folks that are in training at any one time. So it's, I, my son's doing high school chemistry and we were doing equilibrium equations the other day and this just struck me as being math that he hates doing in equilibrium equations. So that's pretty much what our office sort of manages, um, is making sure that equilibrium uh, uh, stays uh, the, way, the, way, the way it is. And you can see, no matter how long you stay for a career in the Air Force, you automatically get out. So the Air Force Medical Service is one of 100% turnover, whether you do four years of service time or 30 plus years of service time but it, it, it is always 100% turnover. Next slide. So this is a picture of AFPC, if you care. Um, I have a cubicle in this building. I've never been in a cubicle in my life, but that's what happens when you get told you're running programs like this in the Air Force. Uh, you don't have a nice office in a medical center anymore, although I do get to see patients. Uh, next slide. So in our branch, uh, there's three areas. This is the Physician Career Management and Medical Retention Standards branch. At some point in your career, you will probably be involved with all three of these branches. Currently, you'll be involved with us in physician education because of uh, the residency training uh, that you'll be going towards and ultimately maybe fellowship training as well. You can see that uh, the Medical Retention Standards branch are folks that have a medical issue that uh, then determines whether they can remain on active duty, so you may end up being involved with them at some point in your career, you may not. And then physician utilization takes care of all of the folks that are out of training and where they move to the different bases. So while you're in training, we handle your orders for your PCS moves to training positions. And then when you're out of training and you're a functioning physician in the Air Force, the physician utilization branch handles all the moves uh, where you're going and so forth. 
And so I really don't have much else to talk about on this slide. So go to the next slide, please. So this is our little shop. Um, you may know some of these folks already based on the letter of your alphabet and, and when you interact with your AFPC representative uh, to get to myself and Colonel LeBay. So the letters that we're currently using are on this uh, list here. This is subject to change because Sergeant Larry recently retired and Lieutenant Colonel LeBay is moving to a different position. So Mr. Z, uh, the bottom guy there, uh, David Zemkowski, is going to be my deputy. And so the letters will change. Uh, so your spirit guide and who you contact may change in the near future here. But um, we have someone coming into Sergeant Larry's position, and, and we'll be redoing some of the things of uh, how we, how we kind of do our, our, our shop. Next slide. So what do we do in physician education? Well, I guess I'm supposedly the subject matter ed expert on medical education. And so we deal with all of these uh, entities that uh, are involved in education. So we deal with licensing, accreditation of all of our programs, uh, and the different certification agencies that you know uh, we have to make sure we're doing a good job with. So a lot of that runs through my office and individually the deans at each of the institutions. Um, we run this health profession education requirements board, which I'll detail later, uh, where we figure out what the MedCorps needs to sustain that equilibrium equation that I was talking to you about, and that changes yearly based on the needs of the Air Force. We also run this Joint Service Selection Board, which is why most of you like to call in to figure out what that is and what's going on with it. We also run the Air Force's Surgeon General CME program, and I get to answer Congress a lot, too, because um, GME and, and, uh, uh, is an area that uh, Congress is very interested in over the last five years. And so uh, they have lots of questions of, uh, you know, higher level questions about GME and, and our medical system as a whole as we go through these changes in the civilian side. So next slide. Um, so we should be talking about our GME programs. So GME in the military is a, is a robust entity. All three services uh, provide graduate medical education. The size of the service determines, and the size of the hospitals determines the complement of folks that do training on active duty status. But in general, all three of the services have about 30% of their active duty medical court in training at any one time um, for docs. So it's a system that all three services use. When you add us up with the VA and you talk about federal training, that between the military and the VA, uh, federal graduate medical education training uh, accounts for nearly 15% of all of the U.S. physicians that are in training. And in any given year, there's about 118,000 residents that are in training. So that gives you an idea between the VA programs and the military programs, how many residents that we, we have uh, training at any one time. So this is a slide that I'm working on updating, but the other services are somewhat challenging uh, to show you about what percentage. And the Air Force, historically, last year was about, uh, or this year is about almost 30%. We may go up a little. And again, every year is going to vary. The Army has certainly uh, more active duty training and more people in their service. So they end up about 34% of their end strength. And the Navy, um, actually last year, this is the first time they dipped a little below us. Um, but I, I think this year they'll probably pop back up again um, as well. So this is a slide I put together to show that where all of our programs are geographically. And you can see that there's Army and Navy programs on here as well because our medical centers, because we have Air Force uh, bodies in these uh, locations or are combined and have joint programs in these locations. So I think my color scheme is pretty cool. Spent a lot of time trying to make it so that you can, you can see that. So hopefully you're on the slide with the map, Mel. Next slide. So these are our Air Force DMEs. So each one of these is in charge of uh, all of the training programs that, that occur at their institution. So some, like uh, Colonel Hanna at Shawshack, have a lot of training programs. And others are, are smaller, like Dr. Titus just has a family medicine training program at Fort Belvoir. Next slide. So this is a list of all of the Air Force uh, graduate medical education training programs and positions at the different uh, uh, 
uh, joint entity. So you can see there's quite a variety of geographic locations and, and what they offer. And so um, obviously uh, the Shawshack, which is uh, Brook Army Medical Center and SAMC, depending on what name you want to call it today, and the National Capital Consortium really have the most numbers of uh, uh, physicians in training in, under their roots. Um, and they're also uh, combined with the civilian uh, training entities in those geographic locations as well. And then you see the rest of our Air Force thing. So we, we pretty much cover just about most of the disciplines um, that the Air Force needs to train. There are some training programs like some of the surgical subspecialties that all that training is done uh, in conjunction with civilian entities. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, a little bit later. So uh, one of the big things that the military programs as a whole have, in particular the Air Force, is we partner with civilian institutions a lot. And so what that means is we're in joint ventures where you may be training in an Air Force hospital and a civilian hospital as part of the overall combination of your program. So if you have a three-year internal medicine residency at Keesler, for instance, you will train at Keesler and you also train at the University of Mississippi. And so, you know, the times that you're at the different locations are going to be different based on the agreements that we have with these civilian institutions. Some are totally in a civilian building, uh, like uh, the Travis internal medicine positions we have uh, that may basically spend 98% of their time. They do maybe one month at Travis, maybe two months of the three years. The rest of it is in UC Davis versus others uh, where your whole training may be in the military facility. Um, and so that's going to be different based on the program and the agreement um, that occurs in those areas. And so our big military partnerships that are kind of our tri-service uh, platforms are uh, San Antonio, which we call Shawshack. Well, I call it Shawshack because I like the movie Shawshack Redemption. And since I trained at the old Wolford Hall, I always think back on those days like, yeah, it kind of was like that movie. Um, but we don't do graduate medical education like that anymore. So it's a mostly Army Air Force, but there are Navy uh, folks, and there's uh, a growing presence of Navy. This will become an ultimate, uh, totally a joint platform over the next decade. And then the National Capital Consortium as well, which is a tri-service joint platform, although the Air Force has the smallest footprint of the three services there. Next slide. So other military partnerships at wright Pat were associated with Wright State University in Dayton, which is a very productive relationship, and the residents that are in those programs do a lot of work downtown. Um, it's geographically co-located, so it makes it real easy to bump between the two institutions. At Nellis, we're, uh, we're partnering with the uh, uh, Nevada uh, School of Medicine in Las Vegas. I mentioned UC Davis already. At Ophit, Nebraska, uh, you actually do a lot of work over at uh, the uh, Medical Center College, oh, that's that's a lot of words. And anyway, you're at University of Nebraska in Omaha is the easy way to say that. Shawshack, you're obviously you get over to the UT Health Science Center, um, Scott Air Force Base. You're uh, co-located with St. Louis School of Medicine, and then at USAF SAM, they work with uh, Wright State University as well. So again, a lot of military civilian partnerships, and we believe this helps actually strengthen our programs. Um, as well because it provides a lot of opportunities uh, uh, in our training programs that you don't necessarily get by going to one particular site. Next slide. Sir, can I, speak in? Can I uh, cut in here real quick? Absolutely, Kelly. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Kelly Adams. I'm program manager here in AFIT. Um, just to kind of go a little bit further into this, uh, the military civilian partnerships for the residency programs, Depending on the specialty that you're looking at and, and what you're doing for rotations at these facilities with partnerships, you could potentially spend all or part of your time during a rotation at some of these civilian uh, partnerships locations also. It could be as much as you know, the full time or as little as a few days to a week or two during the rotation time also. Great, thank you. That's a, that's a very important point. And I'll touch on clerkships, and Kelly will probably chime in with a lot more detailed information um, a little bit later when I talk about our selection board. Um, next slide. 
So our leaders, uh, pretty much all of our GME faculty appointments at both are, are appointed at both military and civilian institutions. Um, you know, we have a lot of nationally recognized academicians and clinicians. Um, you know, we participate in uh, all the same things that uh, civilian uh, academic medicine participates in, in terms of speaking at national meetings, being involved with national medical societies. So there's really no difference being in the military and being a surgeon or an internist than, or being in the Air Force or in, in the civilian side. And so and, and the reality is I think it's a lot better because you, you get to practice medicine in a lot of different venues through your career, both in a deployed and non-deployed setting, that is not necessarily available to a lot of the uh, civilian institutions. And so I, I think we make actually more well-rounded physicians in our training programs because of the unique experiences that they get to get. And our staff are uh, equally as well-rounded because of those unique experiences. Um, and so some of us hold key U.S. specialty organization leadership uh, uh, positions. I'm involved with the National Board of Medical Examiners, um, the National Residency Match Program, and then my uh, uh, ACP organization for internal medicine. And so, you know, a lot of our faculty are going to be involved in these national organizations at different levels uh, as well. And then the Air Force has a specific special experience identifier for our faculty as they become what we call an academic master. And then I call it a grandmaster flash because I grew up in the 80s. But um, at the level of uh, associate professor or full professor with lots of publications and involved in national leadership uh, of specialty organizations, you, you qualify to be labeled as an academic grandmaster. And so, and those get put on your SERF, which follows you around through your military career when you're going through promotions and things like that. So there's a lot of opportunity to get involved with academic medicine uh, in the Air Force as well. So I have a couple of slides on clerkships. And so, you know, the bottom line for doing your clerkship tours is have a clue what you think you want to do and try to get out to the uh, sites that uh, offer clerkship tours and kind of, uh, you know, show them what you got. You know, and the things that these programs are looking for is professionalism. So, you know, you need to show up. You have to have the uniform. You can't have the rank on backwards. All that stuff's kind of important. And then knowing that you went through cot and learned those custom and courtesies, um, you know, that stuff does matter out there in the military. And so, um, you know, when you show up for your rotation, don't do what I did and have an earring and long hair and have to get told to go get cut 20 years ago. Um, no, I didn't really do that. Um, and then, you know, what we're looking for is your performance on these clinical rotations. Um, uh, you know, and I'll touch a little bit more on your uh, USMLE scores uh, and your academic performance in med school when we talk about our selection board um, as well. And so, um, bottom line, when you go you on your clerkship store. Uh, clerkship tours, make it count. You know, express an interest, obviously, ask questions, show your strengths, set up your interview uh, while you're there, um, and, and, and go through that. The more inquisitive and um, interested you are, the better you, you look uh, to the program directors that are ultimately going to be involved in scoring the applications for their specialty. Uh, questions, uh, ask questions of the overall consultant for the career field you're interested in, as well as the program directors. You know, try to get to, if there's a unique military conference for family practice physicians, try to, you know, set up a case where you can go and present your case, even if it's in your civilian medical school, you know, at the military specialty conference, get yourself seen out there. That's all going to help in terms of, uh, of uh, for your ultimate application for our our training programs. And so really what you want to do as you, as you figure out what it is you're interested in is start to establish your network of, you know, sponsors and mentors down the line. So that's the program directors and the career consultant for that field. Um, Kelly, do you have any specifics you want to talk about in terms of the clerkship uh, logistics? Uh, yes, if I could, real quick. Um, uh, Colonel Forgian talked about, he's going to discuss a, a little bit later in the slides, uh, some of the scoring components of the GME Selection Board. And in some of those components, though, um, he's going to talk about the the aspect of 
uh, these rotations that you do and, and how important they are to you uh, during the GME selection board. Um, the interviews that you do while you're on these rotations and the evaluations that are done on you become part of your GME application. So it, remember, even if your first choice is to go into a civilian uh, residency program or in the case of neurosurgery is your only choice, we have the, the civilian programs available, you still have to be selected by the GME Selection Board for one of those civilian quotas to be able to accept or be authorized to contract with a civilian residency program. And so those program directors that you're interviewing with during the rotations and evaluated by are the individuals that are making those selections at the board. So these rotate, military rotations are very, very important even if your you know, goal uh, desire is to go into a civilian program. And so to do these rotations, you're going to need to schedule them. Uh, and the peak months for interviews are generally between May and end of September very, very early October um, between your third and fourth year. Uh, you can find the instructions and forms on our HPSP, AFID HPSP website. Um, once you've logged on to the site, go to the Medical Corps Information tab and then go to the Active Duty Tour tab and you find, again, a, a detailed instructions linked to the form. You're going to find a list of the available specialties at which locations, which happens to coincide with our residency program training platforms. And then it's also going to give you a list of the clerkship coordinators and their contact information. And those coordinators are the individuals that you're going to contact to attend, tentatively schedule your rotation time. Each facility handles their own schedule. Um, and it, it, again, it's, it's a time frame that works best with your academic schedule. They're usually four weeks in length, and they tend to start on a Monday and end on a Friday. Um, we recommend contacting the clerkship coordinators directly. Uh, the DME um, contacts that Colonel Forgione had previously, I think it's slide 14, these are the individuals that are over the entire programs, education programs at those facilities. I do not recommend contacting them directly unless you've had extensive difficulties getting a hold of those, co those clerkship coordinators. Um, if you're ever having problems, give us a call here at AFIT. Ms. Merrill, which I know many of you have um, either to discuss, talked with or emailed with regarding rotations already. Um, she's always available to help you if you are having difficulties. Um, if you have not scheduled your rotations this, for this upcoming summer, please do so now. Some of the facilities are already full and there are uh, wait lists available in some specialties. Um, Ms. Merrill is also currently doing an audit of all the 2017 graduates and anybody that you know maybe not doesn't have a rotation scheduled or has uh, ADTs available, uh, she may be contacting you in the next couple weeks here to you know inquire about your plan or, or see what's what's in the works. Um, to go into you know as far as the scheduling aspect, you know again some of the specialties are filling up. We recommend you use your last two ADTs to attend two military rotations, but we also limit you to the two rotations. Um, if you're having difficulties getting into a specialty, give us a call. Um, we may have other suggestions, or we may even have you talk to Colonel Forgione and his staff there to to see what they recommend. There are some workarounds that we can do, but again, um, if you have questions, you know, my staff here at the office is, is more than willing to and, and happy to help you through the remainder of your, your HPSB time. Just let us know. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, this is Lieutenant Colonel LeBay. One thing that, that you can consider is the location for the clerkship. So, for example, say you wanted to do internal medicine, but all of the internal medicine spots at Sashek are full. You saw the list of different opportunities at Sashek. So you could technically do um, a clerkship in a different um, subspecialty of internal medicine. For example, nephrology or rheumatology or something like that, just to get your foot in the door and have the opportunity to um, interview at that time. So. So sometimes you got to think a little bit outside the box. If you do encounter that the specific rotation you want to be in is full at the time that you have 
the ability to coordinate with your medical school? Absolutely. Um, in, in that scenario, if you would attend at another facility, the only time the, that I, I it, if you're looking at doing that, looking at a specialty that is not as possibly as competitive, so to speak, because by taking up a rotation um, in another specialty that you don't apply, plan on applying for, you could potentially be taking an opportunity away from another individual. However, that is a recommendation, um, you know, something that's kind of outside of the box, and you can spend, you know, some of your downtime over in that specialty that you plan on applying for. In addition, you know, we normally recommend students attend rotations in their first location in that specialty that they're going to apply for. If that first choice location is full, absolutely look at one of the other locations. Um, those, all of those program directors are involved in the selection process in, in that information you know, as far as the evaluation and everything, will transfer on in, into any of the locations. Great, thanks. So next slide is our GME selection process. So go to the next slide. So I already mentioned that we have this Health Professions Education Requirements Board and then our Joint GME Service uh, Selection Board. And so I'm going to go through those uh, in the next few slides here. And, and really, what the goal of these, the, this process is, is to really, you know, figure out what the Air Force needs to maintain our mission, uh, to maintain the academic quality of our programs, and then to provide the professional development opportunities uh, for all of our applicants. So fellowship uh, training, subspecialty training, uh, obviously your basic uh, primary residency training. Um, so next slide. So this is pretty much the timeline of, of how these things work. So uh, Rosie and I are just getting past going through all of the paperwork that's required to figure out what we need to train for this upcoming uh, Joint Selection Board. And it's an exhaustive process, I'll tell you that much, going through antiquated websites and dealing with a whole bunch of consultants from the field that actually look at who's getting out, what positions they need to fill, what new programming missions are occurring in the Air Force, and then we try to put it all together and come up with what we're going to offer uh, in training opportunities next year. And I'll show you what that looks like on a later slide. Um, so that is now done, and we're waiting for the final announcement back to us from the Deputy Surgeon General that controls this, and that usually occurs in May. And as soon as that announcement is made, then what we tend to do is find a way to put it into a, a format that you'll understand and will understand. And then we'll put that on our website. And then that'll be what's available uh, for training opportunities at our upcoming selection board this year. So that process then starts 1 July is when the, the website's going to open. And then 1 July to 31 August, even though this slide's confusing, I think I missed a block on here. Uh, 1 July to 31 August is where you do your initial military application in our website mods. And I have this on a later slide. And in that application, it's kind of like filling out who you are, where you're going to med school, that kind of stuff. And, you know, give us all that important stuff. You're not allowed to tell us over the phone, like socias and, you know, that information. And then um, also choosing what your specialty you want to apply for is going to be. And then uh, setting up, uh, turning in your personal statement and all that. So I call that the, the intent to apply to our board application. And it's required for all the med students, so you better have an intent um, to apply. And then from July, you know, from 1 July up until October 15th is when your interviews and all the supporting documents are due. So we have things like USMLE scores, your dean's letters, your transcripts. Um, letters of recommendation and your interviews, that stuff is all going to be due October 15th. And so this slide I had hidden before, um, but I unhid it, but I forgot I had to add that extra column in there, even though it won't fit nicely, I have to change the font. And then what happens is once all that's done on October 15th, we then go through a scoring process um, in, in the upcoming weeks where all of the program directors for each specialty are involved and the consultants are involved in the panel and depending if you're a med student or a joint applicant, so a staff or a, 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 an active duty person applying for our programs, you, you, you'll have essentially two boards that run during the same time frame with scoring. And then we have a board here at uh, AF 
FPC, which I run, which where all of that scoring is tabulated and we go through and we select the applicants uh, based on how they score. And then the results are released in early December. Historically, we've released it mid-month, but this year we're going to try to release it somewhere around the 7th to 9th, uh, so try to get a week earlier. And in the future, I want to move this up a little bit before Thanksgiving because my anniversary is the week after Thanksgiving, and so my wife doesn't know we're married anymore for the last decade. So I'm trying to fix that. But the other services are interested in moving it up too, not because they have anniversaries that week. Um, next slide. So this is our HPER process. I'm not going to belabor it, but I, I kind of talked that all of our consultants determine what is needed in their career fields and where, and then that is routed through us, the MedCorp director, and ultimately um, the organizational arm of the Air Force that controls all the manning positions. And then uh, that's what generates our GME requirements. We do this every year. And um, so that, as I told you, is a fun process. So the way this has worked historically, and this may be changing if you go to the next slide, is uh, in general, we're allowed to train 900 people a year. And this number is a ridiculous number that hasn't changed in 20 years, so I'm all for changing it. And then what happens is that 900 is broken down. If you look at that column on the left there, that table on the left, we start 900, and then we have a certain number of new starts because when you guys get selected for three, four, five, six years of training, you become pre-obligated totals every year you're in training, and you cost me the ability to start new starts since we were limited to 900. And then sometimes in order to get you guys to be successful applying for some of the uh, fellowship and, and other subspecialty training we have, we have to select you a year in advance to allow you to go through the civilian match already selected by the Air Force so you can compete with civilian counterparts for some of that training. So all in all, when you do the fuzzy math, you end up with about 900 positions a year that I can fund. And, and just based on what my carryovers are, um, that number varies widely in year to year. The other thing that happens is we usually get an influx of additional training positions that the other cores don't use since they do things differently than we do. And on average, we train an additional 50 people a year. So last year, I got to have 950 funded training positions, of which about 310 of them were new starts, is what the numbers ultimately uh, added up to. But that system is being changed this year. I just don't have proof that it's changing, so I'm still kind of educating you that we have limited ability to fund. I can't fund all, you know, 1,300 HPSP students at once to go into residency. The Air Force does not have the funding for that, which is why some people get deferred. The other thing that happens is we don't have the capacity in our active duty training programs that are accredited by the ACGME to handle every single person that's going into specialty training or re residency or fellowship training um, as well because our programs can only train so many based on that accreditation. And the Army and Navy are in the same boat for this as well. So if we go to the next slide, this is the example. I know this may not show real well. It does when you blow it up on the computer. But this is what the HPERB sheet looked like last year for the graduating med students. So this is what you're allowed to apply for. So if you look at anesthesia on the top line, you'll see that for anesthesia residency training, you can see that I offered six positions at Shawshank and 10 in deferred status. So we're able to train 16 people for anesthesia because that's what the needs of the Air Force say we need to meet our mission requirements You know, four years from now. Um, and so the approved length is up to four years of training. The anesthesia programs are four years, and they all start in July 2016. So that's pretty much how this document works. It tells you where the training slots are. Um, you know, in the HPERB itself, it gives you an idea of all the acronyms. I couldn't fit it on the slide or you wouldn't be able to read it. But it's our different institutions, the different types of programs. And it's, this is one that you know, all the medical students are allowed to apply. So when you look at the bottom right of this thing, you see that I have, for med students, I had about 240 slots for, for active duty training. 198 of those are categorical residency training slots, which means you get selected into all five or six years of surgery right off the bat. We don't make everyone do a PGY one year, send them out to a boat for two years, and then bring them all back on active duty, although I think that would be kind of fun. 
I love to see Air Force people on a boat. Um, and then you can see we have some entities have civilian sponsored training. Uh, we may not be able to train all of them on active duty and sometimes offering funding to civilian programs can help get our folks in when, because uh, the civilian side is different. They have a total number of accredited positions in the hospital, but because that hot, that those training positions are based on hospital funding, Medicare funding that goes to the hospitals, they may have a capacity of training 50 people in a discipline, but only train 46 because that's what their hospital funds. So sometimes we can work with civilian institutions and pay the salary of someone going into the civilian residency or fellowship uh, because they can't pay for it, but they have the training capacity available. Sometimes this works well. Other places it doesn't work based on their schedules and a whole bunch of other uh, things that go on. And then you can see we offered 31 PGY-1 training slots um, that weren't tied to ongoing training. Um, and then you see the deferred slots there as well. So that's in general how we tend to approach our health professions board and what we get out of it in terms of being able to provide you exactly the numbers we have available uh, for training. The other services don't necessarily provide this granularity of what's actually available for training. And so we're trying to standardize that. We won't ever go the other way and make it a black box, but we're hoping that the other services uh, have, uh, you know, put out exactly what's available in numbers and locations uh, a little bit better. But we're the Air Force, and I think we're better in some things. Next slide. So when I look at these opportunities for residency, you can see, you know, these were what was listed on the other page. I just don't have it broken out of where all these positions are. Um, and then uh, go to the next slide. Some of our residency opportunities are offered for PGY-2, so you have to complete a PGY-1 year before you can go into some of these disciplines. And this is an evolving field in terms of the ACGME. It used to be more prescribed uh, a few years back where a lot of our residency programs had to do a dedicated PGY-1 year before you went into them, like anesthesia um, and so forth. But now the ACGME has evolved in the accreditation process that some of these disciplines don't require a separate PGY-1 only year anymore. But some still do. And as things move on, what you're probably going to see is uh, a gradual migration away from dedicated PGY-1 years in longer categorical training programs. And so um, that'll probably continue to evolve out there. But there will always be a role for PGY-1 training, um, both in the civilian side and in, in, in the military. So then uh, fellowship opportunities. So not only do you just offer our primary categorical residencies, which is what most of you are interested or must do before you can get into all these uh, subspecialties, but the thing is you need to do the primary training before you get into these subspecialties. But we offer a wide array of opportunities in, in all of our disciplines, um, you know, uh, to continue your development professionally um, as well. And so next slide shows more fellowship opportunities. So I'm on slide 31. And uh, finally, you know, see we do lots of subspecialty training um, as well. And this ends up with what the surgical uh, subspecialties that are offered in our board as well. We also offer a couple of these, uh, I call them non-ACGME accredited nice-to-haves where the Air Force needs someone to do uh, high-level uh, clinical informatics, so we send you for special training for that. Um, but it's not ACGME accredited programs that do this. They're, they're uh, non-ACGME accredited. So we do offer some of those. Those are really available for people that are, are already completed their residency training and are functioning in the field and are trying to go into some very specific areas. So they don't usually apply to you guys as medical students. Next slide. So we talked about the h -perp. We talked about what's available in the selection board, and then we'll talk about the selection board itself. And so this is the dates that I meant to put on that other slide as well, but these are the actual dates of when everything is due. Um, and so I'm not going to repeat everything I said, but it's there in graphical form since some people don't like to listen to words like me. I usually fall asleep in all my lectures. Um, so the bottom line for the Joint Selection Board is, you know, it's competitive, fair, honest, confidential, and all selections are made at the Selection Board. Um, I get a little bit of uh, 
post-board work that I can run back up through the board president, which is currently General Murphy. So when folks don't match or some big issue happens or we have couples that match disparately, I can sometimes work behind the scenes after the fact to try to help you know, make everything balance and make it all work. But there's no guarantee. We try to do all selections at the board. Um, and if we need to have another um, selection, then we go to a, um, a supplemental board. Um, and anyway, the bottom line is, like I mentioned before, you know, we need to serve the Air Force with, with our needs. Next slide. Um, this is a list of all the applications for the last, you know, seven, eight years. And you can see we get a, quite a few applications every year for our training positions. And this just breaks them down into the various groups. Next slide. Um, so this is our results from last year. It'll show you that uh, we selected 390 people into their first choice specialty. That doesn't mean active duty. This is both active duty, deferred, civilian. This is all comers. Um, we had a second choice opportunity for folks. And we selected 25 that didn't match into their first that got a second choice opportunity. Um, and then we had nine medical students that didn't match into their first or second choice. So they did match into their PGY-1 position. So you, we guarantee that um, the medical students that are graduating get selected into at least a PGY-1 um, position. Okay. And then lastly, and my computer just died. So uh, I'm going to have to do the rest of this blindly. I have no idea why it's plugged into a power source that must not be on. Um, but we had 61 folks uh, that um, eventually uh, didn't match into their first choice specialty, but matched into their second choice specialty. All right, into their PGY1 only, sorry. So um, I am trying to bring the computer back up. We found a plug that's actually working. So I am far here. So what that slide shows is that we try to give you the best opportunity to match into a program that you're interested in. The majority of people will match into their first choice, and then we look at the second choices. Um, so everybody that had a second choice, except for nine people, were able to match into their second choice. Uh, the great majority of people that ended up doing a PGY-1 only had not selected a second choice. So their second choice essentially was to do a PGY-1. Um, if so I can chime in here real quick, too. Um, there's something that I know the students have been confused about recently while Colonel Forgio is uh, working on getting systems back up and all. Um, there's been some confusion about the civilian match. And I know there have been a lot of questions. Um, HPSP students all will need to apply to the civilian match. That Absolutely. is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Absolutely. I'm going to get to that in the next couple of slides. OK. Uh, that's something I've added based on the feedback from previous talks. OK, um, excellent. Good. All right, I'm back up. Um, so let's go to the next slide. It says 2015 medical students. It's a big table with green boxes and numbers. So this is not to be taken out of context. And each year I can look specifically at that year group and say, this is what we had applied, this is what we selected, and this is what the few things that we can standardize across the board selections are. So if you take a look at anesthesia on the first line, we had 25 applicants for anesthesia positions. We're able to select 16. Six of them were active duty. Ten were for deferred positions, like I showed you on the age perv. 64% of those, so they matched into their primary choice. Um, and so that's our selection rate. When you look at the average USMLE or COMLEX, that's what the average was for that panel of 16 people that were selected. So again, these are small numbers. And it, just because you didn't get a 233 on your step one doesn't mean you're not going to get selected for anesthesia. There's other things that go into place. But we've been asked for this in the past, trying to provide that information to you guys to at least give you an idea of where you stand, you know, in general with your selection, 
you know, choosing your specialties and where your performance in medical school can either help and steps can either, you know, help or maybe make you, you know, think about how you're going to approach your clerkship and your interview. Again, every year we have different numbers and different kinds and different types of people that apply for these things. Um, so as I can start accruing this data over time, we may get better clarity out of it longer term. But what I can tell you is that with some of these numbers, they're very small. Don't be scared away if you only got a 500 on your Comlex and not a 515. Okay, it's not that. These are averages. Okay, um, so I want to get that across. But these numbers are here. I have no problem letting them out there. I, I hesitate a little bit in some of the smaller disciplines, but that's just the way the numbers work. Um, and again, this is not to discourage you from doing what you want to do. You need to apply for what you want to do in the Air Force when you apply to our match. Okay, But this is an area that allows you to discuss with the program directors and the consultant strategies of how to make your, yourself a better applicant if you're kind of below the averages for these. Okay, and if you're above the averages, it doesn't mean you automatically get selected. Again, these are just averages. So I know I'm beating that to death, but I hate putting statistics out there without the story behind them because I think the story is more important than the statistics. And I was always taught, you know, statistics never lie, but liars use statistics, and I'm not lying to you. Okay. Um, all right, next slide. So this is an old scoring sheet for medical students. Technically, I'm not necessarily supposed to show you this, but the reality is we're a high reliability organization and I want you guys to understand what that means. And so this is old. We use something similar to this now, but it's not the exact scoring system. But what I'm going to tell you about scoring is that there are two main areas we look at. We look at stuff that you've already done which is your med school performance. You don't have much to change at this point of the game, especially if you're, you know, third year getting ready to go into your fourth year. Um, by the time the board comes around, there's only going to be a few more grades in there. And your steps. And so the other thing that we look at in medical students is the potential for success in that discipline you're applying for. And so looking at your med school and your steps, you know, you get a total of five points. And so that's it. And, you know, that's half of the points that you can truly accrue in our selection board. And then looking at that potential for success, you get another up to five points. And that potential comes from your performance on your, on your tours, you know, your active duty tours, how you interview, your personal statement, all of those things that you have some control over that the program directors are evaluating you on. But you can see there's a very small number of things we can really evaluate on this. I don't like this old scoring system. I think it doesn't, has not stayed with the way that our society has moved over the last decade or two. And so we're working on a new scoring system that will incorporate things like communication skills, um, professionalism, and then continue the potential for success, but the bottom line is the new scoring. It doesn't matter what the numbers are. The scoring system is still going to be weighted about half the stuff at this point in your career you can't control anymore, and the other half is stuff that you can control based on your work ethic, your professionalism, and your involvement with the program directors, the residents, and the fellows at the programs that you're doing these active duty tours at. So hopefully that all makes sense. Um, our bottom line is we have wonderful people out there, um, and we want the best people in our programs. That is how the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy approach graduate medical education. It's how all the civilian programs approach it. You know, we want the best people in our programs. And so, you know, we're going to show this to first-year medical students and say, don't punt med school. If you did, it doesn't mean you're done. Okay, um, what I'm telling you is that there's other ways to be successful also, recognizing your limitations and showing improvement and, and so forth, and you can do that on these rotations and so forth. So, uh, so that's a sticky point. Um, we're going to skip the next slide and pretty much go to how you can be successful at our selection board. Uh, so that's slide 40. So bottom line, timely communication with my office. You know, you, we got to be able to get in touch with you. So 
phone numbers and emails and addresses. I mean, I moved every year I was in med school, and I don't think I let Kelly's office know I moved. You know, I was I was a bonehead, and so but that's really hard when we need to contact you guys. Um, so and back then, email was just in its infancy, if you can believe that, and I didn't even understand how it worked. So you know, it was a different time back then. Everything went through my parents home phone number, I think, for me when I was in HPSB. But things are much different now. You guys are all technically savvy, and it's amazing what you guys show me when I work with you in the hospitals technology-wise. Um, we have websites that will provide the information and deadlines, and please don't hesitate to contact my office folks or myself with questions that you have. Um, we are, I'll show you the websites on the last page of the talk. Again, you know, medical school performance predicts future success, okay? It's out there in the GME literature. Um, and so the bottom line is you got to perform well in your rotations and your steps uh, in medical school. Your dean's letters, which most schools are now not ranking, but they still send us where you performed in each class you did as a quintile or a quartile against the peers that were in the same classes as you. So, you know, we know if your school doesn't rank and you pass everything, if you got, you were in the highest quartile for all of your classes, if you're in the lowest quartile, and, and that can be a discriminating, so again, that med school performance uh, counts, and we're going to really hammer the new guys on that, letting them know that they can't punt medical school. Um, you got to talk to the Air Force consultant for your special of interest and the program directors in that field. You know, to learn about what it is to practice in that field, opportunities for mentorship, research, uh, those things. Show the bro programs your best work ethic. You know, showing up and, you know, wanting to leave early to go lay on the beach at Keesler all the time isn't probably your best work ethic. You know, you can go sightseeing on your own time when you're not supposedly working. But you want those residents to tell the program director, man, that guy or that girl was hot. And we, no, I'm sorry, hot is the right, really good at what at, at medical student work. And we want them in our program because that's going to drive a lot past maybe what your med school performance was. So, um, you know, interview by phone at all of the programs that we offer. Okay, even if you don't rotate it at. Each one of our programs is different how they're laid out and their, uh, how their co-located civilian entities interact and what they offer. So just because Wilford Hall or Shawshack has fellowship opportunities doesn't mean that that's the best place for everyone to go do their residency. Um, you know, a lot of our other programs provide a lot of different strengths that they don't offer there and the success rate in getting into fellowship is not hinged on where you train for residency. And that's a very, very, very important point you need to understand. The board doesn't allow it, or in our scoring system, to favor where you train as resident to impact the decision of how you're going to be selected for fellowship. So don't just all go to Shawshack because you think that's the only way you're going to get a specialty fellowship. Colonel, it doesn't work that way. Colonel, I just wanted to jump in real quick. We have about two minutes left, and then it's going to cut us off. So if you could wrap up on anything, that would be great. Awesome. Thanks. And so, uh, you know, go to the next slide. After you get selected for your training, you'll get a letter from us that specifically uh, tells you what you'll need to do. Um, and then the next slide, we're going to skip the active duty service commitments. Uh, the bottom line with the pregnancy is that the Air Force supports up to uh, three months of maternity leave. And so we and our programs all support that. The problem is that your credentialing bodies for being a physician of some type, surgery or medicine, and or the ACG accreditation process of graduating your residency time on time doesn't. So you will be supported to the best interest of the Air Force, but you may delay your residency and or board testing dates for uh, specialty certification and or fellowships uh, based on that. So that's a decision that is something you will be briefed when you start your residency programs by your deans about how the Air Force will not hinder your career at all, but we can't control civilian entities uh, that have standards out there that, that don't necessarily honor the 90-day policy. And that's probably the easiest way for me to say that. 
And then the last slide of the talk is our websites. So right now we have a public website and a military website, the second and third ones. Uh, they're the ones that you can access uh, now about information, how to get in contact with us. We are moving to one website that everyone who is an HPSP or um, military can access without a CAC card um, or with a CAC card if you have one. And so that will probably transition around the time of the board. That's the AFPC website. But we will maintain these other two this year and then probably de-scope them and send you to the AFPC website. And then on our website, you will get access to MODS, which is the program that you'll use to uh, essentially apply for. So, and that's all I got. Great. Well, thank you so much. This could be knocking people off any second. So we really appreciate all your time. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at mel.saroy at amsys.org, and I'll forward anything along to all your presenters today, and that's it for now. Absolutely. We'll answer any questions you have. You can also just call us. Uh, go to our website. Give us a call if you have questions. Um, and thank you for listening, if you're still out there. Great.